Welcome to One Haas, a podcast devoted to bringing the Haas community closer together through your stories. I'm your host, Sean Lee, and my mission is to help open our eyes to the network we never knew we had. So I'm joined by Andreas uh, Martel today of the EWMBA 2019 class. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Sean. Let's um, start off with your background. Can you tell me a little bit about your undergrad and kind of what you did before Haas? Sure, sure. My undergrad was um, very unique. I, uh, I joined the Marine Corps uh, directly after high school. Mm. actually graduated early. wanted a great big adventure, big challenge. Uh-huh. Went to boot camp during my senior year. Came back after boot camp and graduated with my class. Wow. Went off to the fleet and um, you know, my mom, who is a uh, a Buddhist, made me promise that I would get my my bachelor's degree while I was on active duty. So okay, I like to say I graduated from Park University, which is in Missouri. Mm-hmm. I hadn't been out there until about a year ago, right? <laughs> and um, they had distance learning and they had a uh, education center, a few professors on the base that I was at. Wow! So I was just taking classes everywhere I could and. Um, I joke and say that I, I got my bachelor's degree from a Cracker Jack box, <laughs> uh, but my GPA was good. And after I finished my five year enlistment, I decided to uh, get into entrepreneurship. Mm. During my five years, my father sent me cases of wine as care packages, mm-hmm. and I would get into the closet, pull them out. I had to hide that stuff in the barracks, you know. Uh-huh. So I'd pull the bottles out, get on the phone with him, and uh, we would share the same bottles. So he would be back here in California. I would be all the way out in South Carolina or God knows where, and we would drink the same bottles. And he would tell me about, you know, the wine regions, the, the winemaker, the dog that was there, the view that was there. That's really interesting. Is this something um, like cultural in your family, like a tradition? He's a bohemian. Like, okay. So, yeah, to some degree. But yeah, that passion for wine really came from those experiences. And I just wanted to learn more about it. You know, mm-hmm. I would go and, um, you know, walk the aisles and in wine shops, and all of a sudden, I would be really curious about what what was behind all these labels, where they came from, what the property looked like, what the story was. So, what was your entrepreneurial endeavor? It was called Vin Ambassador, and it is uh, tours, travel, and events in wine destinations. Okay. And yeah. when did you start this? I started it in two thousand six. Oh wow! Um, I was twenty two years old. I uh, went to the Burlingame Public Library to pull out a book. Um, I think it was called How to Incorporate Your Own California Corporation, something to that, to that effect. And right. Didn't even buy the book, like photocopied the the templates, mm-hmm. you know, uh, filled them out mm-hmm. with a pen and walked them into the Secretary of State. I had a corporation, I could open a bank account, and then I used these uh, initial contacts that I had from the experience with my father to mm-hmm. go to uh, luxury hotels around San Francisco and say, hey, you know, We've got some off the beaten path properties to take your guests to, mm. and that was the that was the beginning. How did you find your first customer at these hotels? Mm-hmm. Did did you have someone there rep for you, or uh, I cold called the concierge? Mm. I just walked in with you know I think it was a business card, maybe a flyer, fresh face straight out of the straight out of the Marine Corps, not really knowing any better. Yeah, asked them to give me a chance. You know, I guess I also. Bought a uh, a vehicle, registered it with the Public Utilities Commission, mm. got commercial insurance. Right, that's like the the the, the standard. That's the requirement. Mm. But yeah, I didn't know any better. I just just walked in and asked for the business and and got it. And you know, took great care of the guests. Obviously, the producers were top notch producers. Mm-hmm. Uh, really private, intimate experiences. And then I had my personal story associated with the places that the guests were going. I see. Right? I basically shared with them the same thing I just shared with you. And you so, know, where was this? This is in San Francisco. Okay. Yeah, the Ritz Carlton Knob Hill was the first uh, first booking that we got. Wow. You know, it's one of those things where you know you you do a good job for for a company like the Ritz Carlton, and they'll call you again. That's amazing. Yeah. So it's so, been the last ten plus years. So how did you um, build that business up? Built it up through word of mouth referral, um, going around to other hotels, you know, hosting events for the Northern California Concierge Association, mm. working with luxury travel agents. Got connected through um, through the hotels with American Express Centurion Concierge, so got mm-hmm. on their call list. Nice. And uh, in 2011, I started to 
staff, uh, other wine professionals. So actually, let me back up. So I started the company in 2006, and by 2008, I got my sommelier certification. Wow. So now I had producers in my back pockets, I had trust of the industry, and a certification to go forward. Can you, um, can you just... Uh, tell us, uh, layman like yeah. myself, oh, yeah. what is a sommelier certification? Sure. So uh, I studied with the Court of Master Sommeliers, which is some may argue, but I, I sort of saw it as the gold standard in terms of service, sensory evaluation, and and practical knowledge. So, mm-hmm. and what is a uh, sommelier? It's, it's a wine professional. Okay, it's somebody who who knows the art of sensory evaluation, who knows how to. It sounds sort of silly, but open. Prepare the wine, cellar the wine, mm. temperature control the wine, select the right stemware, pour the right amount of wine in the glass. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, you know, uh, understands the concepts between uh, behind food and wine pairings. I see as well. Yeah. So with that course of study, uh, which was a number of classes at the Culinary Institute, the Greystone up in Napa, mm-hmm. uh, followed by the certification exam, which is pretty intense. It's the uh, the theory exam. So you start off uh, with a written examination, go to the blind tasting, and then do a service exam as well. I see. So it's a three-part exam. You've got to pass all all the parts in the same day. And uh, yeah, so studying for it, you know, I never felt like I knew less about wine than the day I sat for that exam. <laughs> it's just, you know, it's it's the whole world of wine. It's pretty intense. It's like the uh, CPA CFA of of the wine world, of the culinary world. I hope I'll never know. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I mean, this begs the question, 10 years in, what brought you to Haas? What brought me to Haas? Wow. Um, so I had the courage, maybe ignorance, to start uh, a small business, mm-hmm. um, but I did not have the knowledge to understand how to scale that business. I feel that. Yeah, yeah. It was also all bootstrapped. So, mm-hmm. you know, I, I saved uh, some money each year that I was in the Marine Corps, and I used that money to... Buy the vehicle, register the company, right. you know, buy the insurance, which was really expensive for a 20, 22 year old to buy commercial insurance. Right. Oh, you know, million plus dollar policy. My God, I think the first policy was like over eight grand a year. Oh my God. Something like that, just for the insurance. That is, yeah. that is crazy. Yep. I thought my $2,000 insurance was expensive. Yeah, yeah, a little intense. So dropped a bunch of money into it and I just didn't know any better. You know, I, I wanted to. I wanted to learn about wine, and I wanted to be a business owner, mm-hmm. and so those two things really drove me for a long time. And you know, I had the vision to to scale the business up, multiple regions, internationalize the company, that kind of thing, right? Like create this 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 concept of international wine travel, right? So mm. uh, embedding in our clients that. Uh, in our clients' minds, that you know, Napa Valley, Sonoma are not the the first and last. Wine destinations, it, right. it might be the, the first for them. Yeah, uh, but there's a whole big world of wine out there, and it's all worth seeing. Wine happens to be grown in places with beautiful weather, beautiful landscape, great food. Mm-hmm. You know, typically pretty old cultures as, as well. So, do you have a favorite region? Oh, favorite region. <laughs> the next one. Yeah, the next one. Let me ask you this: How many wine regions have you been to? Oh wow! It depends how you classify a wine region. Mm. You've got you know California as a wine territory, including um, like the northern and southern as one. Yep, yep. So if you pick up a bottle of um, you know inexpensive wine, mm-hmm. you'll see that label, and it'll it, it may say you know Cabernet Sauvignon, and it'll just say California on it. Mm. That means those grapes came from anywhere within the state of California. Uh, and then there's a subclassification of you know um, north coast. Central Coast, and then within that you've got you know Napa County, Sonoma County, Mendocino County. But within Napa County, for example, you'll have you know you'll have Howell Mountain, you'll have Mount Veeder, you'll have Coombsville, you'll have Oakville. Right. So there's sub sub regions within there. So when you say what is my favorite region, I don't know if I should be as general as possible to kind of encompass more or uh, or as specific as possible. You know. I mean, do you have a? I, I guess I'll say Rioja. I I I've gone out of my way to go to Rioja a number of times. Where's that? That's in uh, northern Spain. Okay. Um, so it's maybe forty-five minutes south of Bilbao. Mm-hmm. Um, 
which has got the Guggenheim, the mm. Frank Gehry Modern Art Museum. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it just reminds me of like um, like just an ancient territory with like uh, caballeros and stone, um, you know, stonework architecture. Uh, some you know small villages with cobblestone streets, and they're all sort of spread out. You know, some are up on little hills, some are sort of in uh, more of the flatlands. And um, it's nice as you're driving through that region, you can really see very far. So mm. some of the some of the wineries with the more exquisite architecture. Uh, more modern architecture, typically, um, they look like little, you know, packages or you know, little, little art fixtures all around. So that's pretty outstanding. I'll also say that the wine delivers well above its price point. Mm-hmm. Typically, it's one of the frustrating things about loving wine is it's it's definitely an expensive habit. Uh-huh. So falling in love with the regions that are maybe less written about a little bit less, mm-hmm. but also um, you know, just as historic, you know, still great. Quality producers, just you know, the critics can only get around to so many. Yeah, you know, darlings, I suppose. So, being in business school, you know, our audience being MBAs. Yeah, what is your pitch for Vin Ambassadors? What's my pitch for Vin Ambassador? Um, well, the tagline that I came up with a few years is um, transforming uh, renowned wine regions into meaningful destinations. Mm. And so, the thought behind that. Is to change the conversation about wine. So it's not just about how much is this wine, uh, what is the score behind the wine, mm-hmm. but giving people the desire, the impulse to actually go to these places, discover for themselves, embed their story along with the wine. Right. And so that when they're pouring, because wine's very social, right? Mm-hmm. It's one of those drinks where you you know you pour it out and you pour a glass for somebody, yeah. and they ask you about it. Right. If you bring a six pack of beer, nobody says like, "Oh, like where where was this beer made?" <laughs> Generally speaking, mm-hmm. the craft beer movement is that's changing a little bit. Right. But wine, it's one of those things where you know people will pick up the bottle and you know purse their lips together and they'll say, "Ooh, what is this? You mm-hmm. know, where did you get this? What's the story behind this wine?" Mm-hmm. Which is totally cool, and it's something that I, that I think is is ubiquitous with all wine drinkers. And so, why not have a really great story? Mm-hmm. You know, you can drink a fifty dollar bottle of wine and have a five hundred dollar story, right? As opposed to drinking, you know, a five hundred dollar bottle of wine and having five dollar story, right. right? So that's sort of the that's sort of the idea. Nice, yeah. So, can you tell us what Vin Ambassadors um, offer in terms of services for sure for clients? Sure, the bread and butter of the service is um, is private sommelier tours. Mm. So we'll. Um, We'll get in contact with the guest one way or another, and really start off with a consultation. Really find out who they are, where they're coming from, um, what experiences they've had in the past, what kind of wines they drink, what kind of price points they're comfortable with. If this is a buying trip or more of a leisure trip, because this, there's really distinct uh, itineraries that can be made. Um, you know, there's there's extraordinary large estates with art galleries. There's incredibly hard to get into properties for collectors. Mm-hmm. You know, very expensive wines, uh, very long waiting lists, and then you've got you know off the beaten path producers, where you may spend you know two hours or more with the winemaker who also happens to be the owner. Right. And as wonderful as that sounds, you know, it's 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 a really special experience, mm-hmm. and there's never a requirement to purchase wine, but it's one of those things where we have to know that it's not. Uh, a bachelor party or a bachelorette party or something like that. Right. It's not. Uh, it's not Disneyland. Yeah. You know, you're coming into somebody's home to. You're sitting down with an artisan to taste their wines. So it's. We need to know that that it's essentially in their in their wheelhouse if it would be potentially a good fit. Right. And then what we'll do is we'll basically get on the phone. You know, do like a test itinerary, outline the itinerary, what kind of uh, producers we think would be a good fit. And then basically start making calls, you know, finding out who's available, putting in uh, midday dining or picnic in the vineyards, get all that locked up, package up all the all the fees so that you know it's transparent with uh, with the guests, right? And uh, meet them the day of the experience. How yeah, long are these uh, excursions? These experiences typically? Wow. Yeah. Um, well, what's a range? Range figure eight to fourteen hours. Okay. Yeah. So they can be pretty long days, and those that's typically when when guests are really excited. They want to get out, get started early, maybe even have breakfast up in wine country with some coffee, mm. uh, get that first tasting of the day, and then um, 
taste throughout the day, have lunch, do some tastings in the afternoon. We have a few uh, wineries that are willing to open up late for us, mm-hmm. especially the smaller places. You know, might be the last appointment of the day. We may not leave there until seven. Wow. You know, off the record. <laughs> and then the guests will will have uh, dinner lined up for them as well. Got right. it. So, and you provide all the transportation mm-hmm. and logistics. Okay. Yep. 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 Uh, we use all uh, Mercedes Benz. Stock the vehicles with all the amenities, so they're you know they're comfortable. Uh, typically have like binoculars, maps, you know, some wine books and stuff nice. like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you never know where the conversations are going to go with guests, and you know, if all of a sudden we're talking about, you know, we we find out midway through the trip that they're really into French wines, or you know, they're from a certain part of France that produces amazing wines. They're from there, their family's from there, but they've never heard of the wines. Mm-hmm. It's like, well, we've got to pull this book open. I've got to show you the map of where you're from and. You know, show them that they're surrounded by wine territories. It's just one example. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. What are some of the most memorable experiences or uh, clients you've had yeah. in the past 10 years? Because that, that example that you just brought up uh-huh. um, prompted this question. Oh, memorable experiences in the last 10 years. Boy, oh boy. I mean, l- let me ask you this Do you travel with, uh, if a client requests to go to, say, Spain? Yeah, or uh, Italy. Mm-hmm. You travel as a sommelier to these locations. Yep, definitely done that before. Yeah, and that's really, and that's really the pivot um, that I'm looking to make here at Haas. I'm mm-hmm. looking to uh, add a travel component, either you know, bolt on the capability to sell wine or partner with a with a wine retailer mm-hmm. online, but. Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, the the bread and butter of our business is the private excursions here from Northern California, and you know that includes Napa, Sonoma, Mendocino, Santa Cruz, Santa Barbara. Mm-hmm. But there's a big world of wine out there. Yeah, you know, and so yeah, getting getting out to the next horizon. I'm currently working with some people in uh, the Basque Country, so Northern Spain, Catalonia, uh, Champagne, mm. Bordeaux. So these are places that we have lined up and have capabilities. Yeah. In fact, we're looking to do the second annual Haas trip to Champagne this summer. Sean, I don't know. You're more than welcome. What is what is this uh, Haas trip? So last year, Ben Vickery and I went to Champagne to visit um, a buddy of mine who's a, who's a winemaker. He's an eighth generation winemaker of um, Chate, uh, Chateau uh, Bonnet Ponson. And uh, he just built, uh, I think, an eight-unit uh, hotel on his property. Wow! Uh, so the winery is underneath the hotel. The caves are underneath the winery. The caves? Yes. Yeah. He's got wine caves underneath. So oh, yeah. wine caves. Mm-hmm. Got it. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's in the village of Chamery. It's a premier crew, premier crew village. Yeah, we just went out there for a few nights. Um, had some great meals. Visited some great wineries and. That sounds amazing. Yeah, hung out with some winemakers. You know, just chummed it up in the rural countryside of Champagne. Is this something you promote to Haas students? You've been really, I've actually been really uh, pretty bad at promoting these types of trips. <laughs> uh, you know, the the wine buses to uh, Napa and Sonoma have kind of gone through, and I haven't really gotten too involved with that. I'm really looking to figure out how I can get to Europe and how I can how I can fortify an ambassador over there mm. because I think. You know, at least for me, my interests. I am pretty saturated on Northern California wines. Mm-hmm. You know, they're amazing. I recommend everybody to go to wine country and experience it. Patronize the area. Go there. You know, buy the wine, drink the wine. Right. And you know, to be perfectly frank, if you if you can't afford the wines of Napa, I can't afford the wines of Napa. <laughs> Find a region that produces wines that you can afford and go there. And learn that, it. That may be a really interesting service that you provide. Yeah. Is is that knowledge? Yeah. That tell me more about that. Of what you just said. Yeah. That I've never even thought that's possible. That sure, if I can't afford this wine, there there may be a wine elsewhere in another region, oh, yeah. another place that I can't afford that I oh, can yeah. enjoy. Listen, man, Mendocino. It's 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 a little bit farther away. Figure, you know, plan three hours to get up there. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you can break up the drive. You're going to go through. Um, from San Francisco, you'll cross the Golden Gate Bridge. You'll go up through Marin. You'll go through. Um, you'll basically bypass uh, Napa. You'll go through uh, Sonoma County, and Mendocino is just right up there. And um, you know, there you're looking. A- average bottle price is maybe 
thirty-five dollars, mm. f- maybe forty-five dollars. And in and in Napa Valley, you know, the vast majority of wines that you're going to come into, you know, places that have tasting rooms, they're going to be starting at eighty, starting at mm. ninety. Um, and the ones that they're convincing you are really good are going to be one hundred and fifty or more. Right. Right. You know, and so. Especially as a as a novice wine consumer, I, what I did to develop my palate is really hunt and peck, try a lot of different things. Mm-hmm. And when you're trying a lot of different things, well outside your price point, you know it, it's going to be really hard. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to be really hard to develop your palate just because you're going to be constrained by how much you can drink and and what you can select from. So if you find a region like Mendocino, even Santa Barbara, really the farther you go away from Napa, you're going to get much more accessible price points mm-hmm. and you'll be able to take chances a lot more mm-hmm. and not all the wines are going to be great but you're going to learn something with every bottle and most importantly find a region that you can connect with it's got a few nice restaurants maybe right. you know a nice place that you stayed whether that's you know a boutique hotel hotel chain or a vacation home Right. Or even an RV, you yeah. know. I mean, it really, it really doesn't matter. I think it's 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 what's important is to get out there, get your boots in the soil, walk the vineyards, see the landscape, which is another really important thing. You know, studying for the sommelier exam, I was reading about all these regions, about what the slopes were like, what the soil was like, what the humidity might might be like during certain seasons, and you know, it's. It's something that you can memorize. It takes an awful lot of flashcards, but when you go to these places and you see it, mm-hmm. you know, and you talk about like um, volcanic soils, right? Mm-hmm. And you walk out into a vineyard that's got black rocks and it looks like broken up pieces of lava. It's like yeah. okay, like I'm not going to forget that when yeah. I read about it next time. That paragraph of in the in the wine encyclopedia is going to read like an old friend, mm. right? The volcanic soils of X Y Z, right? Right, and you'll see it. You'll remember seeing it. You'll remember picking it up. You'll remember crushing it in your hands. You'll remember smelling your fingers. You know, and that is. It's just. It ties the wines to your your mind. Yeah. Right? So the the sense of smell is the sense that's most closely associated with memory. Hmm. Everybody relates to that. You know, they hear that song and they go back to their high school dance or whatever it might be, right? Mm-hmm. But the sense of smell actually triggers. Well, it is a physiological trigger. So, mm-hmm. um, smells can make you, you know, can make uh, can give you goosebumps. Yeah. Right. They can make you perspire. They that's can right. Make you nervous. They can make you swear that your grandmother is around the corner. Mm-hmm. Like that's my grandmother's apple pie or whatever it may mm-hmm. be. And you're, it's like I've never been in a room that smells like this before, except when Grandma was making this. Yeah. You know. So, yeah. So I think that's that's really amazing to get your. Your sensory evaluation with wine grounded in real experiences makes the wines easier to identify, and then it also ties all of these real emotions to the wines. Mm. So now when you're at home and you pull a bottle out, you open it up, pour yourself a glass, swirl it around, put your nose in it, always smell the wines. Don't just sip the wines, smell the wines. And you know when these wines are, are from places that you've been, they'll mm-hmm. remind you of your trip. They'll remind you of conversations you had. They'll remind you of sunsets that you saw. They'll remind you of who you were with. And you know, there's just so much more. If you want to talk MBA terms, you know, there's so much more utility in mm-hmm. that than buying a hundred and fifty dollar wine with a good score. Yeah, you know, uh, uh, from a store. Yeah, and let's be honest, you don't know that critic anyways. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you are very good at painting a picture. Cool. Right for the listener. I mean, just I'm sitting across from you here, but I'm just picturing myself as a listener. How you're tying these descriptions together with a, the sense of smell, and you're absolutely right. Think back to the last memorable glass of wine I had. I had no idea what the wine was. Mm-hmm. Uh, first off, if there's anything I remember from the moment, is the smell. The smell of the wine. The smell of the beach. Yep. The smell of the ocean. Yep. And you're absolutely right. That sense of smell is. Very powerful for our memory. Yeah, yeah, and you know, and people will, you know, you'll you'll pour someone a glass of wine, and the first thing that they'll do is they'll they'll taste it, Mm -hmm. you know, and that's actually two steps. If you're going to do sensory evaluation, which is somewhat technical, but it's also the same way that you know a real estate appraiser will appraise a home. It's the same way that an art appraiser will. You know, appraise a, a, a fine piece of artwork. Right. Um, same way that a car mechanic diagnoses, you know, a faulty engine. Mm-hmm. Right. There, are, there are steps, and so 
as a as a connoisseur or just as a, as an enthusiast, look at the wine first, mm. right? That's going to give you some signals. Smell the wine. That's going to give you some signals. Taste the wine and and continuously go through this process mm-hmm. because if you're just focusing on taste, you just you know put it in your mouth and you just compare that to everything else that you've tasted. Mm-hmm. You're losing two other dimensions to catalog that that mm-hmm. experience, which is the visual uh, the visual aspects of the wine as well as the aroma right. aromatics of the wine. Can you teach a class on this? Absolutely, at please. Absolutely. Why don't we have a class like that here? I'm pretty Haas. sure there's a club. Actually, I know for a fact there's a club. But do they teach? Do they have? I don't. I don't know what they the, do. Is, there's a Haas wine club. Okay. Are you part of it? I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> I have. Uh, what's the story I, there? Ah, uh, what's the story there? <laughs> and then um, give me off record. So. I don't know what the story is there because, to be honest, um, I've never been to any of the club meetings. I think Greg LeBlanc is affiliated, who's a, a fantastic professor. A uh, really insp- inspiring individual. I think he's affiliated with it some way, which means that's all the validation mm-hmm. I should need. Yeah. But to be honest, getting through core curriculum was was an uphill battle. Yeah. Alone, yeah. and then now getting into electives, I'm getting you know flooded with all these different ways I can approach the business and right, different right. you know management structures on top and, of running your business. Yes, mm-hmm. absolutely. Yeah. Which has certainly taken a backseat. Yeah. You know, but. Um, yeah, I guess I guess I just felt like, you know, I came to Haas to learn business, ethics, management, data analysis, you know, like more of the quantitative tools but also the the qualitative tools to kind of indicate when you might want to use one right, or another right. and how to to value you get to a number and it's like, okay, well, how do you how do you weight that number? And that's mm-hmm. where the qualitative side comes in. So that's been really enlightening. I didn't come to Haas to to learn more about wine. Mm-hmm. Happy to teach it. Makes sense. Happy as hell to drink it. Makes sense. Um, but I think that's probably why uh, I didn't uh, join the wine club. Uh, I'd be a little bit. I, I mean, I'm interested in learning a bit more about wine business. You know, it would be fun to to be able to do some cases on you know wineries and be able to yeah. you know analyze a winery backwards and forwards from yeah. you know the vines and the depreciation of land, which is something that's unique to to vin- uh, wine uh, agriculture, mm. is uh, you can depreciate the vines, um, so you'll have some for accounting, for accounting purposes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so uh, understanding exactly how that works, you know, this is the I guess the the secondary market. So if you're not going to make wine mm-hmm. with your fruit, you can also sell it. Got right? it. You've got long term contracts that can be a strategic play. Got it. To where you know if you build a small wine brand. But you've got a hundred acres. You can make wine just out of a couple acres. Get the demand up for that. Have long-term contracts for the rest of your fruit, and then mm. sort of grow into your vineyards, Makes right? Sense. And so, understanding what the strategies around that could be, what the opportunities around that could be, and then going into the winemaking, you're talking about chemistry, biology, but you're also talking major business, right? Because you know <laughs> you can make wine in a in a plastic paint bucket, mm-hmm. or you can make wine in a you know five hundred thousand dollar cask, mm-hmm. right? And then you know the barrels are going to cost twelve to fifteen hundred dollars each, right? Mm-hmm. And if you have got temperature controlled uh, warehouses to store your wine versus mm-hmm. um, putting them underground in caves, right? Um, lots of decisions to make, and then understanding how time really builds a wine brand as mm-hmm. well. So, you know, when you have the land paid off 30 years later, you yeah. know, what are the economics around a vineyard as compared to coming in with a ton of capital, right? right I mean, right. it's really really capital intensive. And then you've got the marketing side of it, distribution channels, whether it's uh, distributors, e-commerce, you know, direct to consumer and with the direct to consumer component, that's visitors coming to the winery, having some sort of experience tasting the wine. Mm-hmm. No middleman or woman, just the wine's going out the front door. Got it. You know, wineries are also starting to resemble restaurants and retail shops, mm. right? That have a certain price for a table yep. with sparkling water and a cheese plate, and they have a chef there, mm-hmm. and they'll pair the wines with you know. And so you're looking at a fairly complex business model for a product that's been artisanal for centuries, right? Right. You know, grape growing, winemaking, consumer packaged goods, and also like hospitality yeah. and, and restaurant, right? 
And so unpacking how those different business models, how those different capabilities really complement each other, what type of opportunities, you know, if you have both, if it, mm-hmm. you know, which is more economical, which is going to be, you know, a loss leader. Right. Yeah, I would love to do that if anybody is interested in doing some extra credit and kind mm-hmm. of digging. I mean, I've got I've got contacts at wineries that would love to have some MBAs probably, you know, Dig through and see if they can find, pardon the pun, some low hanging fruit right. <laughs> for their business. And I'll, like I'll, you know, mm-hmm. um, yeah. And the hotel industry is really interesting around wine destinations. You know, the culinary scene is just these these wine regions are are, are mini ecosystems mm. as well. So yeah, I'd I'd like to uh, to dig into that a little bit more. In yes. addition, in addition to some sensory evaluation. <laughs> Well, de- definitely, I, I would be looking forward to a uh, for you to lead um, like a session like that. Sure, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Really yeah cool. Small, yeah, a nice little intimate group would be a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. And you know, one of the most satisfying things as a wine professional is to show people that they know a whole lot more about wine than they think they do, mm. or that they have the capacity to learn a whole lot more than they think they can. Mm. You know, I can put five wines uh, in front of you that look the same, right? In less than an hour, maybe thirty minutes, yeah. you know, you can you can do the sensory evaluation and and pick them out blind. You know? Well, what we'll do is we'll definitely, as you're talking about this, we'll yeah. definitely share a link to Vin Ambassadors in the description of this podcast. Yeah. But I think what we can also do is maybe create like a Google form and then just see if uh, any students are interested in signing up and you know taking a class from you, just a novice class. I, I'd be really interested in that. So. Yeah. Uh, and have you bring some wine for us um, to to taste? Yeah, that'd be really cool. Yeah, send you guys away with some knowledge. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. Well, this has been a really fascinating conversation. Thank you so much for being on the podcast today. Right on, Sean. Thank you for tuning in today. My aim is to bring the Haas community closer together through your stories. We're always looking for Haasies willing to share their stories and experiences so that we can give you more insights into the different programs, different careers, and ultimately different perspectives. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. Please feel free to email me for suggestions on how I can improve this podcast or if you have any recommendations on people or content you'd like to hear. My email is reachshawn at berkeley.edu. That's spelled R-E-A-C-H-S-E-A-N at berkeley.edu. 